When was the last time you watched a video or a TV show or a movie and you started having some sort of emotional reaction to it? You may not even remember the details of the piece, but you definitely remember how you felt about it. What if it were possible to create content that made your audience feel things, which is literally the biggest reason that people engage with content in the first place? And what if those feelings caused your audience to build emotional connection with you and your content, and they watched more and more of it, blowing up your engagement and watch time, and maybe even remembering you or your content for years to come? Not only is it possible, it happens every day. Here's how to make it happen for you. Welcome to the Story Greenlight Podcast, where we're all about empowering creators like you to tell your stories, connect with your audience, and create the impact that you were put on this planet to make. My name is Jeff Barch. I'm a coach, author, and entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience shaping content for ABC, NBC, Universal, Disney, Apple, and a whole bunch of others. My team and I support YouTube creators with followings in the hundreds to the many millions. At Story Greenlight, we believe that you matter, your message matters, and the world needs to hear what you have to say. Howdy, glad you're here. Got some seriously cool stuff to share with you today, so buckle up. When I was thinking about what I'd want to have in a podcast, when I was first thinking about setting it up last year, I knew that I wanted a mix of guest episodes that feature experts and their knowledge, and I also knew that I wanted to do solo episodes where I bring ideas of my own to the table. And this is one of those solo episodes, and what I'm digging into this time is one of the most powerful ideas that any content creator anywhere can put into play to build connection between you and your audience. And it's an idea that I call the thing under the thing. And when I first started talking about it a few years ago, the responses I got were immediately along the lines of, whoa, that's really powerful. Then people would usually pause and say something along the lines of, so exactly how does that work and how on earth do I use it for myself? And the fact is, I have not always explained this idea very well, which is why I'm always working to update and clarify ideas like this. So if the thing under the thing is new to you, uh, you get the benefit of the learning from every video and every presentation that I've ever done on it. And if you have heard me talk about the thing under the thing, you also get the benefit of this here being my latest take on it. Because the stuff I'm gonna be talking about here is ridiculously powerful. It is so powerful, it is rare that anyone actually uses it to its full potential. But even using parts of it will build a bond between you and your audience, and usually without your audience even knowing that it's happening. To get the most out of this episode here, you'll wanna check out a couple of earlier ones. Now, first, definitely listen to episode seven about how to tell a story. It lays out what story structure is, how it expands and contracts, and how the actual power of the story comes from a place outside the story itself. And the big conversation takeaway from that is that when it comes to telling stories, the power of story does not come from the story itself. It comes from the emotion that the audience feels and the audience's desire for their own internal change. Now, that might seem like a bit of a spoiler, but it's not. It'll make more sense once you have an idea of how a story actually works. Then. The other episode that you need to make sure you listen to first is episode nine, where I talk about how to give your audience what they want. And the big takeaway from that episode is that audiences consume content for two main reasons. Number one, to get information, and number two, to experience some kind of change in their emotional state. But the fact is, even for the people who say they want information, what they don't usually realize is that they don't want just the information. They actually want the feelings that come from having the information. So when it comes to consuming content online or anywhere else, people want to feel things. If we as creators can influence the way that our audience feels, we are giving them one of the foundational things that they want, period. And when that happens, the audience falls in love with us and our content, and they want more of it. I ended the last episode with a couple quotes that are worth revisiting here. The first one from the poet Maya Angelou. She said, and this is one of my favorite quotes. She says, 
I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. This is true in life, and it is absolutely true as content creators. And if we can make our audience feel things, our audience will care about our content and they will want more of it. So the question everyone always has is, great, so how do we make people feel things? And the answer might kind of surprise you because the fact is we can't make anyone feel anything. That result of the audience feeling something isn't in our control as creators, and it actually happens in our audience's heart and mind. So they're in the driver's seat, not us. We can point the directions and we can we can direct things, but uh, it's ultimately up to our audience to, to decide how they think and how they feel. What we can do as creators is attach our content to our ideas that our audience is already emotionally connected to. We speak to things that our audience already cares about. Advertising and marketing people have known this for a long time already. And the other quote from the last episode comes from a man by the name of Eugene Schwartz. Now, if you ever got into the show Mad Men when it was still on, Eugene Schwartz, he was one of those guys. He was one of the original real life Mad Men, and he was one of the most respected and highly compensated marketing minds in the history of advertising. He wrote advertising campaigns that made millions upon millions and millions of, of dollars in sales. He wrote 10 books including one that some people consider the best book on copywriting ever written. It's called Breakthrough Advertising. I kid you not. There, there is actually a website where you can go. If you look up Breakthrough Advertising, Eugene Schwartz, there is a site that offers the book for sale as an authorized reprint from Schwartz's estate. But if you were to go to Amazon and you look up Breakthrough Advertising, you will only find used copies, and they usually sell for about 500 bucks a piece. It's... And, and that is not an error. That's literally how much these books go for. Now, for the record, sometimes this trips people up. When we're talking about copywriting, it's not about having a copyright on something in terms of having ownership or control. Someone who is a copywriter is someone who writes words, headlines, articles. That's all collectively known as copy. So the thing that professional copywriters and marketers know, the most powerfully received material lives and dies by knowing how the audience thinks and feels. And a lot of people have tried to use copy to drum up emotion in their audience. And usually it doesn't work very well. And even in the times when it kind of seems like it is working, it's not ultimately because of the content itself. It's because of the audience and what they feel inside themselves, inside their own hearts and minds. So here's what Schwartz said in his book, Breakthrough Advertising. Copy cannot create desire for a product. It can only take the hopes, dreams, and fears that already exist in the hearts of millions of people and focus those already existing desires onto a particular product. This is the copywriter's task, not to create this mass desire, but to channel and direct it. So I'm gonna read this again, as I did in the previous episode, and change out a few words for this conversation here. Content cannot create emotion by itself. It can only take the hopes, dreams, and fears that already exist in the hearts of millions of people and focus those already existing desires in a particular direction. This is the content creator's task, not to create this mass desire, but to channel and direct it. So think of it this way. It's kind of hard for a sailboat to go anywhere where there's no wind. But if the wind is there, you can raise your sails the right way and you can literally travel across the ocean by harnessing the wind that's already there. The question that everyone always has at this point is, great, I would love to know how to do that. How do we make people feel things? Multiple ways. First, we have to speak the right way to the right people. This is foundational. You have to know your audience and what they want. And it is way easier to do that in a powerful way when you're speaking to specific groups of people. And the more specific, the better, because audiences care about content that it feels like this was made specifically for me. That's number one. The second thing, the second way to make people feel things is per the discussion in episode seven, 
make people feel things by telling a story that shows or brings change, either in the characters in the story or even better, in the audience themselves. Third way to make people feel things. We channel our inner Eugene Schwartz by talking about things they already care about. So imagine a picture of an iceberg. We always hear the saying of that's just the tip of the iceberg. An iceberg, of course, you know, you see just a small section of it. And then when you, if you were to look below the surface of the water, that's where the vast majority of this massive hulk of frozen water, the ice, actually lives. And what we see on the surface is just a fraction of what is there below the surface. It's true for icebergs and it's true in content creation. This is true in life. What I'd like to make a comparison here is the stuff that that tip of the iceberg. We can talk about that in terms of what we see and what we think. And then all that stuff underneath the surface is about what we imagine and what we feel. Now, here's the problem. Most content creators just do the stuff up on the surface, talking about what we see and what we think. Super surface level stuff. And we wonder why nobody cares about that. And the, and the reason is we're only talking about surface level things that are obvious and it, they tend to have very little depth to them. It's what I call the thing. And the real power in communication lies in the stuff under the surface. It's not what we see and what we think. It's what we imagine and what we feel. And what I call that, all that section of the iceberg and all that that imagining and feeling stuff under the surface, that is what I refer to as the thing under the thing. So most people talk about just surface level stuff up on the surface, that's the thing. The deep, meaningful stuff under the surface is the thing under the thing. Now, you get this idea working for you. It is emotional super glue between you and your audience. What exactly is the thing under the thing? It is a deep fundamental idea connected to a surface level idea. And this is the core of the entire concept right here. It's all about connecting things from the surface to deeper things below the surface. The whole point is to use those surface level things to point to deep important things that people already care about. Schwartz is talking about you have to harness the emotion that's already there. You are the sailboat raising your sails to take advantage of the wind that's already there. Now, sometimes that connection is already there and other times that connection can be created. Let's go outside the world of content creation and talk about the idea of symbolism. Now, we're all familiar with the idea of symbolism. It's where you have a thing that's connected to an idea. That's the general idea of symbolism. So imagine if you are, uh, well, especially for folks here in the United States, imagine this, you have a combination of lines and colors. Imagine 13 alternating red and white stripes and you have a, a section of blue with 50 white stars on it. So got that in your head? We all know what that is. It's our national flag. It is the flag of the United States of America. So it's a design. You can put that design on a, on a nylon cloth and you can hang it up on a flagpole in front of buildings. You can take that design and you can put it on a patch and you can put it on the uniform of uh, someone in the military. You can put this design on a jumbotron at a sporting event. You can put this design all over the place. A piece of nylon cloth hanging on a flagpole or a patch on a uniform or a graphic on a big format jumbotron. That is all examples of the thing. It's a piece of weather-resistant cloth and embroidered patches and an image on a giant TV. But the power of this design comes from the meaning that we attach to it. What does this design mean? What are the core ideas that people have connected this design to? Let's just say there are a lot of ideas 
that have been attached to this design. And some of them are literally the polar opposites of each other. And they are still all felt very, very personally by different people. So there are some people who will look at this design, red and white stripes, white stars on a blue field, and they will say they, that this represents self-reliance, that this is about a country designed to let, to let you create your own life and your own reality of limitless potential. Other people will look at that same design and say it represents passivity, a country where people rely on the government to provide for them and where other people say that the government should provide for them. You have people who look at that design at those red and white stripes and those stars on the, on the field, and they say it represents belonging. It's about a place of comfort, of family and friends, a way of life that you love. And there are other people who say that it represents exclusion, a place that keeps certain people out and a place where you might happen to be physically present, but you're not welcome. You feel disconnected and you live a way of life that is deeply hurtful and alienating then you have someone who looks at that design and says, this represents equality. A country where everyone can be who you want to be and achieve anything that you want to achieve. You have other people who say equally as strongly that it represents inequality. A country whose founders said that all men are created equal, but what they really meant was that you're created equal if you're a man with white skin with ancestors from Europe and you believe and behave in a certain way, and if your skin is not white, if you're not male, and if you live or believe differently from the Western European folk, that whole, that all men are created equal line doesn't apply to you. So which of these ideas are right? And the fact of the matter is, they are all right. And it's not just because I'm saying so, they are all correct because there are people out there who have made those connections. Those connections exist, therefore those connections are correct for those people. They have made those connections between that thing, the American flag, and the thing under the thing, all these ideas that I just talked about, and thousands of ideas just like them. Now, unless I miss my guess, you are probably feeling some feelings right now. You are probably agreeing with me on certain things and you are disagreeing with me on others. You may even be feeling kind of annoyed at me right now because I'm bringing up ideas connected to this thing, this symbol that you've made your own connections and I'm talking about different connections other than yours. If you want any proof of how powerful this stuff is, it's here. And please understand, I'm not here to tell you what your connection should be between the thing and these things under the things. That is up to you. But I guarantee you've already made those connections for yourself and you have opinions, probably some very strong opinions about them. The point of this is, as creators, we need to know that when we talk about certain surface things, our audience has already made those connections in their mind. And when we use the thing to point to those same things under the thing, we trigger people to feel those emotions that they've already put in place. We are pushing our audience's emotional buttons and they care about that a lot. This is just one example of a symbol where the audience has already made the connections between the thing and the thing under the thing. So let's talk about an example where those connections were actively created by the creator. And to do that, we need to talk about beer. Imagine this. You are an executive at Anheuser-Busch and you make Budweiser beer. You make lots and lots of beer. And your number one goal in life is to sell as much Budweiser beer as humanly possible. You call up the marketing department and you say, how can we sell more beer? They say, let us think about it. We'll get back to you. And a few days later, the marketing team comes back to you and says, we will sell more beer by making TV commercials that connect our beer to horses. Now, you think it's kind of weird, but you know that your marketing team is pretty smart. And so you ask some more questions and you say, so horses, uh, like maybe those little tiny pony ride 
that kids ride on at an amusement park kind of horse? And your marketing crew said, no, no, no. We're talking Clydesdale horses, majestic, massive, beautiful animals, and not just one of them, a whole team of them harnessed together, pulling a whole wagon of uh, an, an old style Budweiser carriage filled with beer. People will see our commercials and they will think about how powerful and beautiful these horses are and how they represent the traditions of our great country and what those people want to be for themselves. They will connect all of those ideas to our beer and that will make them buy more of it. Now you think that idea sounds a little weird, but you approve the commercial campaign. The audiences go nuts over it and sales of Budweiser beer go through the roof. A year later, you go back to your marketing team and you say, hey, so this using TV commercials about horses to sell beer is working pretty well. People like it. Got any ideas for how we can make them love it even more? Marketing team says, hmm, let us think about it. We'll get back to you. They come back a few days later and they say, we've got it. The Super Bowl, the American football Super Bowl is coming up. And so it's this enormous stage where there are millions and millions of people watching this television broadcast. And so we are going to spend $3 million for a 60 second Super Bowl commercial about horses and a puppy. And so you, you can see where I'm going here. I mean, this, obviously this is not just a random story with goofy ideas. This is literally what Anheuser-Busch has been doing for decades now. If you go look up Budweiser Super Bowl commercials, you will see they, they tell stories about cute puppies having friendships with horses and they show horses running with their manes flowing in the wind. You know, it's this symbol of strength and freedom and all the things. And they have been doing this for a very long time and it really, really works well. They've been doing it because it takes surface ideas like horses and puppies and you connect those ideas to emotional buttons like strength, tradition, friendship, and commitment. And people in the target market for those commercials feel all sorts of warm fuzzies. They connect those warm fuzzies to Budweiser and they buy lots and lots of beer. This is how it works. In case you're thinking at this point, dude, we're not talking about politics and flags and Super Bowl commercials here. We're talking about YouTube videos. Does this apply to YouTube? The answer is yes, 100%. Think of the travel video genre. Why do you think it's so massively popular? Because travel already has deep connections in place for most people. It's not because it makes you think of getting on a plane and flying somewhere that you normally wouldn't go. That's just the surface thing. That's just the thing. Travel videos are so popular because it transports the audience's mind into a different world. It provides entertainment where it helps the viewer imagine their life being different, going somewhere else than where they are right now imagining a change for themselves. Travel videos literally let viewers transform their everyday boring life into something exciting and unique, if only for a few minutes. And it's not just because the thing under the thing connections are already in place for travel, which they absolutely are, and everyone has them in one form or another. You can actively shape those connections too. So you can have a certain kind of travel video that's super mellow and relaxed. If you want to actively shape the thing under the thing for your travel videos as, you, as something to get away and relax, then you want to show people lying on a beach sipping on a Mai Tai. But you can actively shape it in a completely opposite direction if you want the thing under the thing to be adventure, then you check out something like Sam Calder, who has millions of views on, his, on these videos where, yes, he's going to exotic places and he's getting crazy drone shots, but those aren't the thing. Uh, th those are the thing. They are not the thing under the thing. The thing under the thing for Sam Calder travel videos, it is all about adventure. It's about being a dude who has eight pack abs, 
who makes out with hot women in super exotic places that may or may not actually have teal or, or orange color grades in real life. And if he only ever showed drone shots and scenic B-roll of the places that he went to, the impact of these videos would be completely different. He shoots and edits his pieces to show the idea of his of adventure. And his audience says, holy moly, I'm going on an adventure just watching this video. And this is why creators emulate their heroes because they want to connect themselves with someone who's already in a place where they want to be. At this point, you might be thinking, okay, that's all well and good if you're doing travel videos in places with exotic beaches or you're doing your own vlog or something, but what about my stuff? It is not exotic, it's not energetic, and I'm really not into the whole emotional thing either. I mean, does the thing under the thing work for my stuff too? And the answer is absolutely yes. Emotions are super powerful. The thing is, you don't have to ugly cry on camera and wallow in lots of squishy emotions to use the thing under the thing. It's really easy to do that if you want to, uh, but you just need to connect your content to things that your people care about. So here's an example that happened not so long ago. The COVID virus shut down the world. There was a time when my hair was getting long and all the hair salons in Los Angeles were shut down. We were still living in California at the time and my hair was getting super scruffy and I wanted to clean it up before I went on camera to do some recording. Now, here's the thing. I had never cut my own hair and neither has my wife. I, I had no idea how to do it. So of course, what did I do? I went to YouTube. I had my micro moment. I, want, I had my want to know moment of how do I cut my hair? And I typed in cut hair at home men. Up pops a video from Aaron Marino at Alpha M. And uh, he's, he opens up the video and says, gentlemen, desperate times call for desperate measures. I'm gonna show you how to cut your own hair at home and still look good. Okay, turns out I wasn't the only one who was having this issue. Aaron wanted to cut his own hair at home too, so he made this video and he shows you step-by-step -step how to cut your hair at home. It's a straight up do-it-yourself tutorial. Then at the end, he hammers home that, that connection to the thing under the thing, not by getting all emotional, but talking about things that matter to his young male crowd. And he says at the end of this video, he says, I wanted to do this video to show you that even when times are weird, you still have control. Plus, it's kind of badass to learn a new skill. So there you have it. In just a few sentences, Aaron took the thing of a home haircut super surface level, how do you cut your hair? And he pushed the emotional buttons of his audience's desire to be in control, even when times are crazy, and to look good, and even to be a badass. And you know what? I watched that video, I went over to the bathroom sink, grabbed the hair clippers, and I gotta tell you, I did feel in control and I did feel like a badass because I'd never done this to myself before. And, and I knew that I was taking control of the situation and making it happen. And then I completely proceeded to jack up my hair and I sliced away all my sideburns and all that kind of thing. It wasn't the end of the world, but it was not a professional haircut in any sense of the word. But as my mom always says, the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut is about three days. And that is what the thing under the thing is. It can be something as complex as seeing a national flag and triggering our beliefs on how the way the world should work, or it can be as simple as a dude giving a tutorial video on how to cut your own hair. When you create and shape those connections, this is how we as creators set out in our own creative sailboats. We raise our conceptual sails and we harness the emotional winds that already are blowing in the hearts and the minds of our audience. What do you think about this stuff? You agree, disagree? I think I'm completely out in left field. If you have ideas on this, if you have comments, let me know. I'm always looking for ways to update how I think about these ideas, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
And otherwise, it's likely that even after all this explanation and examples, you might be wondering exactly how to put these ideas into use with your own content. Or maybe if it's still possible to use this stuff with your content at all. If you are, then I've got two things for you. Number one, you need to know that it is absolutely possible to use the thing under the thing with your content, even if you think your content doesn't work with it. And you will benefit from this and your audience will benefit from it. And you and your audience will grow closer together when you use this well. And number two, for specifics of how to make this stuff work with your own content, then you should absolutely join us in our creator community called The Green Room. It is our private community here at Story Greenlight that is all about helping you apply these kind of ideas to your content and to your life. We're all about helping you level up your content, level up yourself, and get things done with the support of an active community of creators like us. You can get full access to The Green Room for a month for free. You can get started right now at the link in the description below. I'll see you there.